This is Solo Travel Talk. Your solo travel advisor is Astrid Clements. It's pretty hard to find a place that Astrid has not visited. After all, she has been traveling solo for nearly 40 years. On this episode of Solo Travel Talk, we're going to take a peek into Astrid's dream list and hear about three destinations that are on her solo travel to visit list and why they are there. I'm producer Catherine O'Brien. Here's the theory. If a place is of interest to Astrid, your solo travel advisor, it's probably interesting to you. Let's get inspired by some of the places Astrid wants to experience. You haven't been to every continent yet, have you? Well, I must admit, no. It has been a lifelong goal of mine to take a around-the-world trip, which I did do that. But I haven't been to every continent. From all of our, I guess you would have to say, geography lessons or even from elementary geography, we learned that there are seven continents. Asia, Africa, Antarctica, Oceania, North, and South America. And basically, I've been to five of the seven. Australia, Oceania, I haven't been to as well as Antarctica. But I'm headed in that direction. (laughs) (laughs) Really, the main reason I haven't gone to these two places, and the main reason why most who love to travel haven't been there, who don't live in the Far East or in that part of the world, it's, it's so far away. The flights are extremely long in all the different countries around it, New Zealand and Bora Bora and French Polynesia. It's all spread out. So it's a long way away. It's very spread out. And it's just really hard for a solo traveler to take that much time and to experience it. And it's hard to even manage your budget with it. So that's one of the reasons why I really haven't been there. And it's difficult. So Bottom line, the logistics for trips to Antarctica or Oceania are highly challenging for the solo traveler, and that's why I haven't been there. But I have found ways to tackle the challenge that I feel comfortable with. So with that said, next question. Okay, we've challenged you to give us three places that are on your to-visit list. And I kind of broke it into a couple of little things here. So we're going to go through the place. Why it made it onto your list. That's what I'm really curious about. Why is it on your list? And because this is solo travel talk, we're going to get the solo travel factor about how solo friendly you think it's going to be, maybe some of your expectations, and then when you think you're going to get there. First, No, no, I'm not going to do that. Let me just tell you. Okay. For me to answer this question is like wrestling (laughs) and taming a tiger. Three. (laughs) Oh, my God. Three. But let me just go through how. I reacted when you said uh, this first outline. I thought, well, I'll just whip this up. It won't take me about an hour to go through this process. <laughs> but I love to travel so much, and my mind started really expanding. There's so many wonderful places in the world that I haven't been to yet, and I have been to a lot of places. I have almost 60,000 photographs. I mean, let me tell you something. I have really traveled. So for me to narrow it down to three, oh my God. Oh, no way. But I was disciplined with this and I will get there, but you have to let me develop it okay. for, for our listening audience. Right. So, but it really was a timely activity because it's kind of at this period of the year when I start thinking about What are going to be my major trips for 2019? Because I'll start working on my budget for Astrid Solo Travel Advisor, my website, what I put the podcast on and my blogs, etc. So it was good for me to really think about what I wanted to do in 2009 and why. So as fate would have it, Right after I received this solo travel dreaming podcast outline, (laughs) my latest edition of Travel and Leisure, the September edition, arrived in the mail. And the focus of this edition, they must have known I was going to do this, 
have to think about where I wanted to go. But basically, it was the Editor's Choice Awards for 2018. Places, experiences, and things that wowed us. Mm. So this is a wonderful edition of Travel and Leisure. I highly recommend it. I read it from cover to cover, and it gave me all kinds of ideas. They talked about, well, Japan. Japan really is a place I've never been. I've been all over, but I haven't tackled Japan. But Japan, Cuba, Alaska, Castle Stays in Ireland. Amazon cruises, even the Texas Hill Country. These are just a few of the things that they touched on. But all of this piqued my interest. But I thought, you know, let me kind of deep dive into this and see, do I really want to go there? Or is this a dream place that I want to go in 2019? I want to go to all these places eventually. But is it going to make it on my list? Is it important enough for me now. So as I really started to think about it, where I wanted to go and why, I thought about what was I really in the mood for? I mean, what's going to really touch me deeply with my next solo travel adventures? So I kind of boiled it down to like six mood trip types that emerged from my travel dreaming and research. I'm taking you through my thought process. Yeah, that's part of the point of this. Yeah. Okay. Now, you know, you just crammed me into this little <laughs> link. I cannot. <laughs> I think these constraints are going to help you refine <laughs> your creative. Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I'm not mm-hmm. fussing. This is, a, okay. this is good because this is all good information. Okay. So the six kind of mood or the types of travel that I really want to do and this is not in any order of importance, is travel to sacred places. That's always touched me, and the older that I get, I'm more fascinated by spiritual things, sacred things, things that happened in the past, and why were they relevant then? Are they relevant today to me? And just kind of understanding how Beliefs and cultures are blending and not blending, and et cetera. So I find it very interesting, especially there's lots of times gorgeous architecture surrounding that, et cetera. The next topic is wellness retreats. And I'm going to go into why I narrowed it down to six in just a second. Then a road trip is another one. The fifth one is ever elusive India. I've tried to go to India four times but something's blocking me. And then a long stay at an iconic hotel. There's something about staying at an iconic hotel that is great. Every now and then, that's all I want is just give me ultra luxury. Of course, last, Oceania or Antarctica. I was determined to figure out exactly how I want to do this and carve out enough time because it's going to take longer than any of the other trips and make that happen and do it efficiently, but give me a quality experience. Okay, a little bit more about each one of these topics because I think it will give the listener also some inspiration on how you discern really where you want to go. Not just because it's got a beach or not just because, oh, it's famous or whatever. You got to kind of tie a lot of things for travel to really be valuable to you, enjoyable to you, meaningful to you. You got to tie it to some of the things that move you or interest you or where you want to expand yourself, etc. So, Sacred places, I mean, that's always been something interesting to me, and even more so as I get older. But one of the things, I guess, probably that has always just mystified me is why certain things or certain events happen in certain places, certain cultures evolve and blend. And what are the spiritual and religious beliefs that 
play into a particular area or spot of the world. Now, you can say, oh, well, it's because there were no mountains there, or this was a great area for a port. There was no bad weather, so the big ships could come in. I mean, there are geographical things that make things happen, and there are other things that make things happen. And could be something that we don't totally understand in the modern world. So for a couple examples, I've been to Stonehenge Glastonbury Tour. That's an area of England where they have the crop circles and all that. And they keep saying, well, they don't know where they come from. And I'm not sure if they're not jiving us or anything yet. But when I went to Stonehenge, I must say, I really felt there was something very mysterious about this. There was an energy there. I knew it's a famous place, and the whole thing is prehistoric spiritual beliefs, and this, to me, was some form of crude temple. But why there? And what were they believing? It just what was the life like during these times, etc. So when I went to Stonehenge, I must say, It just got me to thinking, this is so interesting to me. I'm going to have to figure out more about everything, figure out more about my family, who I really am, what has motivated us. I mean, my mind can just, whoo. Well, I ended up reading some articles on ley lines. And ley lines are these electromagnetic energy fields that go through the earth on longitude, latitude, angles, everything. And this is where the energy fields are stronger on these ley lines. And you will be surprised. There are so many famous buildings from the old ancient architecture and things that were built on these ley lines where they intersect. I mean, there are even churches, pilgrimages that traverse a ley line. Now, whether the people that live there were more sensitive to energy and they wanted to put it there or they just did it and they didn't know why it was there. So I could feel some energy there and I didn't know what I was feeling, but until I came across that article, that just started a lot of stuff for me. And I've done things like going to the Chartres Cathedral in Chartres, France. It's very famous. Or this labyrinth. It is right on a crossing of ley lines. And it's a very sacred place. And people go there for inspiration. They go there for healing. They still walk the labyrinth that is actually in the church. I've walked the labyrinth. In fact, when I went there, they had chairs on it. I moved all the chairs off. <laughs> I might go across the ocean, come in there, and could walk that famous labyrinth. But I've done that. And I must say, every time I've walked a labyrinth, I have had some kind of emotional response shortly after doing it. And I wasn't trying to get all emotional. I'm not an emotional person. I basically love life, whatever, but I don't like to be sad, cry over anything because I like to work through it intellectually and deal with it in give it to God really most of the time. But I mean, I had some experiences that I thought about things that I couldn't believe I was thinking of. And let me tell you, they were pretty profound because they led to other things. So as I traveled and did these things, I started to do, well, I better be paying attention because I'm getting some very good growth from all of this. Mm -hmm. So of course, the Vatican and Rome, that didn't move me as much. It wasn't a positive experience. That's all I could say. I could see the beauty and grandeur, but I was turned off by several things. And I don't want to go into that because I was a Catholic. I grew up a Catholic. It's just part of the past. It's the way evolution and man and countries and power evolved. But it is a sacred place, and it's a special place. A lot of things have happened, seen and unseen within the walls of the Vatican. Then Istanbul, likewise. Oh my God, the old Constantinople. So much went on at that time. That was important. Loved Istanbul. Went to the Hagia Sophia, the Blue Mosque, another beautiful mosque. 
the Hagia Sophia specifically, because it was a Christian church. It might have even been a Jewish synagogue at one time, but finally a Muslim church. And so I really did like Istanbul for, I guess you would say, my introduction to the Muslim world and the Muslim faith. So it was a very good experience because I experienced a kind of a combination of Europe and the Muslim world kind of blended together. So even though it didn't hit me as a totally spiritual place, I had some growth there in terms of understanding how there were similarities but differences and both had good things about them, okay? The biggest experience I ever had was going to Egypt and going to Cairo, taking a cruise down the Nile Valley, going to all those ancient temples and tombs, and with our Egyptologists taking us through their spiritual beliefs and how it interrelated to the stars and nature, and what they believed with the afterlife, and a person dying, and resurrecting, and everything. And all I could think about, it kind of sounds like Christianity. It's like they said the same thing then as they said in Christianity, but changed some of the players and the heroes. And I don't mean to sound trite about that, but there's kind of a similar theme, or themes that go through all religions. So you saw that very strong in Egypt, and I was shocked at it. And I had some emotional, strange moments in Egypt that I definitely didn't expect to have. And some kind of weird things that happened to me that were a little bit of a confirmation, and I don't want to get goofy and way out there because I'm not like that. But I do pay attention to things that are more intense or that catch my eye. Everybody has those things that it means something to them, but it doesn't mean anything to anybody else, and it was for them to know. So, and a lot of times it takes you to travel all over the world to get those kinds of messages or whatever you want to say. It's amazing how that happens when you travel, and I haven't totally figured all of that out yet, but I'm working on it. (laughs) But that's why I like to go to sacred places, because it does do something to your beliefs and your understanding for a lot of things, to be at that place, in the place, feel the energy. It's a great part of travel for me. Other places like Beijing, the Forbidden City, totally different spiritual belief, spiritual everything. But likewise, I liked it. There was something very refined and kind of basic, And even some of the structures reminded me what I saw in Egypt. Now, how does that get over to China? At relatively a short period of time. I mean, I love that kind of thing. Because every now and then I do connect the dots that were far apart, but they do connect. (laughs) Segev Passad, where the Russian Orthodox Church, that's basically their Vatican, their Rome, is there. I've been all through that. Oh, that's just so beautiful in there. And it's a hallowed ground. That's what I'm saying. To go to these places where there's hallowed ground, you absorb it, whether you know it or not consciously. I really do believe that you absorb it. A lot of times really is something very special that is there. Okay, so I decided that That was really a mood that I was interested in. And the reason why I'm talking about it, too, is because I think that there are a lot of people that think along these lines, too, but don't really realize that there are a lot of different places you can go to and different types of tour guides or travel experiences that can open up some of these ties to the spiritual beliefs and culture and everything from time has gone past in particular places that people will enjoy experiencing 
not just learning the facts, but how is that meaningful to them today? And you'd be surprised when you think you're not going to be moved by anything. Phew, that's when all of a sudden the bolt comes in. So I wrote a few other little things. I said I love to light candles and say prayers for my family and friends in churches all over the world. It doesn't matter what faith it is. I just love being in churches. A lot of times I can just feel all the prayers that have been said in here and the pain that has been released in here and the the cry for mercy and the love and the compassion that can come from a greater understanding that started by sitting in a church praying. You can feel that. Sometimes I thought, you know, I love these churches so much. It would be so cool to live in a church. <laughs> I know that sounds so wacky. But what I'm saying is these beautiful buildings, and a lot of them now are just basically empty. And it's kind of sad to tell you the truth. But I think somebody ought to buy it, make a gorgeous mansion, and they could probably get it for a cheap price. <laughs> and really have a gorgeous place to live in. And you'd have all those prayers around you. They would still be there. Now, that's a poor out thing. <laughs> and I know a lot of my listeners will catch all that drift. But I like to go into churches. That's all I'm saying. And I'm a Christian, but I'm not a practicing Christian. I don't go to church every week because I guess I feel like I really got all the lessons when I was young. And I try to live like that every day. So I feel totally enlightened when it comes to that part of my faith. But I'm out there trying to learn about all the different faiths because I find it fascinating why Hindus believe what they do and they're concentrated in this area and how it just meshes so wonderfully with all their cultural traditions and all of that and and how it makes their life rich and makes them willing to strive hard every day, and a a lot of times just based on a faith and a belief. I think it's beautiful, to tell you the truth. And most all of the various cultures and religions really have been rooted to a particular place. So I love to try to travel to them and fully comprehend all these belief systems, what went on there. Is it, like I said, relevant? How is it relevant there then? Is it relevant today? And do I believe it? And is it relevant for me? Is this something for me to really strive to learn, to understand? You know, a lot of times I've thought about this um, that some of the Hindus and everything that do this chanting and everything. And when I first heard it, I thought, oh, that's kind of scary. I don't know why they're doing that. And I've tried to think, well, They talk about how you basically get yourself to this complete emptying of thoughts and everything. And if you can get on that sound, that wavelength, lots of good healing and inspiration, and real your real essence will be able to come out. Now, I know I'm getting way off track, but I can tell you, those kinds of things fascinate me. I I want to see if I can get to some of those points to be closer to God and to be the best person I can be and to help the world survive and stay in balance and people choose good versus things that harm themselves and harm others. So I think travel that's geared to some kind of sacred component is a very good type of travel experience. You don't have to go full-blown sacred, kind of stick your toes in it if you're not really of that bent. But a lot of people like all this new age, and that's interesting too. I mean, with all these people, and I've gone to astrologers and channelers. I am one of these people that like to learn and experience. If I don't like something, I pull back. If it's uncomfortable to me, I go, no, I'm not going to do that. Getting the heebie-jeebies or something like that. But I'm open to it. And it's all helped. It's never really been 
anything that I think was not productive. Now, the next topic, the wellness retreats. Most everyone is experiencing more and more stress in their lives. And the travel and the health-oriented communities are consequently offering more and more great wellness-focused retreats and travel experiences. You know, these types of travel destinations are really not just your typical luxurious spa. These are experiences that have really in-depth personal growth and rejuvenation programs. And I first saw these about, eh, they started really getting more prolific about six, seven years ago. But they're workshops for people to get through grief. They will go to a beautiful hotel, and it, it's not just like a conference. Some of the older, earlier ones were a combination of pampering and spa, and then also counseling and certain techniques to try to take you through a particular thing that was blocking something in your life from healing or whatever. And these kind of programs started really catching on because, you know, all the statistics show you that, unfortunately, we are having more and more issues with mental health and with stress and with people becoming dependent on all different types of drugs, that being well and protecting your health, which includes your psychological, your emotional, your physical, and your spiritual Health is so important. So there's a lot of places now that deal with wellness, healing or strengthening your mind or whatever. And solo travelers are responding more and more to these types of services when they pick their travel choices. Now, I really have only been to two, and that was before the mainstream, the real kind of mind, body, and soul type of healing and nurturing and that kind of thing came on. Mine was more like health-oriented and spa, like the Greenbrier in West Virginia. Uh, I actually went with my husband probably 30-something years ago. That was the most beautiful, old, historic, luxurious resort. Well, we went there because my husband got this fantastic physical and he had to do it because he had to get some insurance for something. So we went to the Greenbrier to do it. Well, on top of the physical, they had all kinds of things that told you what you needed to do to stay in top shape. You know, you weren't having enough vitamin D. This was a very front runner of how they analyze your health now. And they would give you a program that was based on medical evidence to do that. Plus, then you had all the activities, the horseback riding, the archery, the salt baths, the steam baths, and Turkish baths. They had all these different things that there was not a whole proliferation of spa-like things. I mean, this was 35 years ago. So that was kind of some of the beginning of it. And then my husband and I, one Christmas uh, holidays, we took a three-week road trip through Europe, and our last stop was at Baden-Baden at their spa and wellness center. And he got a physical again there. I don't know what he was doing, get physicals all over the world. I'm still not sure about that, but it's okay. It didn't matter. But theirs was even more scientific. And I know in Europe there are a lot of places. Germany, for a long time, required their workers to take what they call a core, or they have to go for a week to like a facility like this, get a physical, give them a program of what they need to do, et cetera. But this Baden-Baden was over the top. I mean, it had a casino. It was so fancy. In fact, we had eaten so much fancy food. (laughs) My husband said, and he doesn't like McDonald's, he said, you know what I want? I don't want any more venison. I want a McDonald's hamburger and french fries. <laughs> but that's the only thing I've experienced there. So I haven't done this much travel. So that really made it on my mood list. 
because I want to get to my best, best. And these kinds of things, I think, can really help you do that. You can't do it on your own sometimes. Next one, road trips. Now, road trips, I just love, love, love interesting road trips. It's a throwback to my childhood road trips that I took with my father and my sister. We just love to get in the car. I love to go anywhere in the car when I was young. And the road trips, oh, that was so fun. It was just like some kind of fantasy that I was living that I had seen on TV. But I love to get in the car and drive and drive down roads that I've never been before. But when you take a road trip, you really do get to see the scenery. Once you get out of the metropolitan areas, the whole thing takes on a different essence. And if you're able to relax, and you're not stressed out because you're thinking about something else, this is not going fast enough, or whatever is bothering If you can just drive, turn on the radio, start singing, turn back to the songs when you were young and took those first road trips, whatever it takes to get in that mood, it's wonderful. You start seeing things you never would have noticed normally. Also, if you're on this type of trip, you have your car, and you can go wherever you want to go. And you can leave when you want to leave. And there's a lot of flexibility about having a car the whole time while you're traveling. Now, there are some negatives about it, and we don't have to go into that. Because these road trips really don't focus on big metropolitan areas. Road trips are more about the open roads, going to the smaller towns, connecting with the bigger cities, then moving on out to the next one and experiencing the different landscapes, the different foods, the different architecture, flowers, just everything. But you start seeing how there's all these many cultures Mm. that start evolving. And it affects you in a very nice way. It's kind of like you're renewed. Also, when you're on a road trip, especially if it's for any period of time, You have a lot of time to think. And when you have a lot of time to think, then your mind will get out of some of its routine, confining thought patterns. Oh, to me, there's something about motion, too. Just moving, I think that energy stimulates that. And then if you don't have to think about, I got to do all this stuff for work and this deadline and I've got to read 500 pages in less than three hours and it's impossible and I do this every day and how am I going to stand it? But when you get out of that and then you're driving and day after day and you're seeing new things, oh boy, you just feel young again. That's the way it affects me. So that's really, because I haven't done a road trip in a while. Now I went from Miami to Maine up the East Coast. That was the longest that I'd ever done a road trip. And I stopped at 13 different places along the way. And I really saw that culture change, the architecture change, the the social moors change, the food types change, the weather change. And even though it was on the coast, all these changes. I mean, when I got through that trip, all I could think is, you know, America is awesome. I was blown away. I was blown away by the time in Long Island, my time in Cape Cod, in in Maine, in uh, New Hampshire, Jekyll Island, Charleston, Savannah, St. Augustine, Boca Raton, Miami Beach. I mean, they're all different. And going up that coast like that and spending a week, almost a week in every place, one of the best travel experiences I've ever had. So I really am committed to a road trip. I almost took a San Diego to Seattle. That's my next real long one. Now you got to really plan because you can be gone for a trip like that if you want to do it well for six weeks. So you have to have that much time because you don't want to drive too much. You want to drive a little bit and stop, sit a spell, Start talking to the locals, 
Go to the candy museum and some of the <laughs> things you would never go to. But I tell you, if you could slow down and do that, you're going to really start liking it. And you're going to think, why do I have to work so hard? <laughs> but it will be a trip that will be so memorable that you'll be so happy you did it. So that's one. And then also I thought, well, hell, I might just go from D.C., Washington, D.C. to L.A., you know, wow. east to west. <laughs> But that's that's not in 2019. Okay. But a road trip, yes. So then ever elusive India. Like I said, I have tried to go to India four times in the last 10 years, and something has always blocked me. In fact, when I went on my around-the-world trip solo, India, Mumbai was one of the seven cities that I visited. When I was getting on the plane, or checking in for my flight with Air Emirates from Abu Dhabi to Mumbai, they looked at my passport and my visa paperwork. They said, you know, your visa is not totally valid. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, you don't have this one number here. And I said, well, I filled it out online, and this is what they printed back to me. And they said, I'm telling you, it's not valid. And if we let you get on the plane, they're not going to let you get off. And so, to make a long story short, I couldn't solve the problem that day in Abu Dhabi. So, I ended up having to reroute my trip and go to Singapore, which was a great city to travel to. And it really didn't turn out to be a bad thing. But I didn't get to go to Mumbai. I mean, I could not believe it. And one of the reasons why I think that it's been blocked is the way that I wanted to do it, it still didn't solve all of my real concerns, which my mm. biggest concern is safety, whether it's physical safety, food safety, overall health safety. And India is so spread out. It has a lot of cultural diversity, and there's a lot of poverty there. And there's a lot of things that are going to shock a Westerner about their culture and the way that they live. And I know my husband's traveled there several times. And one time when he went, he got some kind of intestinal bug that took him six months to get rid of. And he was staying in very nice hotels. So I've always wanted to go. I mean, I really have wanted to go. But something has always blocked me. And I'll talk a little bit more about India later, but it's been one of my greatest challenges to get to. I've been to Russia four times, China for five weeks solo, Egypt, Morocco, Middle East, several places in the Middle East solo, all over Mexico solo, Thailand, Colombia. I didn't have any problems with anything because I figured it all out and I felt safe and I was safe. And they were beautiful trips. India, they call it the Incredible India. To me, it's elusive India. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I'm determined to go there. Okay, the next mood thing is a long stay at iconic hotels. Now, for older solo travelers, a week at an iconic hotel or resort in a beautiful area of the world, it can be the perfect solo experience because here you're in elegant surroundings you have first class services excellent food beautiful lounges spas all kinds of wonderful things they're like escaping to shangri-la and for an older person especially a solo traveler who doesn't have it if they can go somewhere beautiful and be pampered etc it's wonderful you don't have to pack and unpack or anything like that. And one of the, the inspirations for me to do this kind of travel, because I do like to do that every now and then. I like to go somewhere fabulous, ultra luxurious, and just totally escape into fantasy world, okay? Well, there was an older lady that I met at the Brown Hotel in Lexington, Kentucky. This is not a fabulous resort. But it's the best hotel. It's a historic hotel in Lexington. And I was talking to her. She was having a drink in the lounge. 
And we started talking, and she eventually told me, she said, you know what I do? She said, I love great hotels. And what I do is every year I go to some great hotel, and I stay there a week, and I get them to wait on me, and I just have the time of my life. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's not so <laughs> bad of an idea. Like idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she really had the tiger by the tail. She was going to do this till she's 105 years old. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you. And I've done a lot of this kind of thing. I mean, the Fountain Blue Hotel. I mean, I remember going there with my father when I was nine years old. And this was a magnificent resort. Ultra modern, S-shape, Art Deco, magnificent architecture, all these fabulous pools. Frank Sinatra was there. I mean, people were just so unbelievably glamorous. I thought, you know, boy, I got to get out of Louisiana. <laughs> Even at nine years old, I said, woo, woo, <laughs> this is something else. But that's the kind of thing that goes on on these fabulous hotels. So I've drugged my husband to a lot of them. I guess when I do my solo travel, I mean, I stay in five-star hotels and they're nice, but there are lots of times they're boutique hotels, relay, chateau type of things, not these grandiose resorts. Now, I will do that, but in the past, I haven't done that. So the ones that I've been to, a lot of times have been with him. But as I've gotten older and he doesn't want to travel as much, that is one type of trip that I think should be considered. You don't have to go somewhere and do all kinds of stuff. Just go to a fabulous hotel because there's something to be said to be served and pampered and just detach, just detach. So that was made it onto my mood too. Then the last is I'm going to either, I thought, well, I'm definitely going to Oceana or I'm going to Antarctica. I mean, I got to check off one of those last two continents. And really, I have to admit, I have wanted to go to Australia, to New Zealand, and all those Polynesian islands for probably the last 20 years. But they haven't been as interesting to me, their cultures, as all the other places that I've been to to date. And likewise, they're so far away from where I live. The thought of a 24-hour, basically, flight, because I have to fly from Louisiana to the West Coast and then on to Australia, and maybe a stop in between before you get to Australia, that's a long flight. And once you go over there, Australia, and then if you want to go to New Zealand, you have to have a good block of time to do that. And then, after you've done all that, You have to fly that horrible flight back. So I keep thinking, I'm going to have to really be in the mood for that. And then when I do that, I miss those. I miss like Bora Bora and all of these Polynesians. I used to love Valley High, that movie and play. So it just hadn't made it to the top yet because it's going to cost a considerable amount of money. Going there is never cheap. And to do it like I like to do it and the way I travel, I know I'm going to have to budget and really plan for it. So I never have been able to make it fit with the budget, with the timing and all of that. But I do want to go there. So it's either there or it's Antarctica. And I've really started getting some very good ideas Mm -hmm. about how I as a solo traveler can tackle Antarctica. But you really have to be prepared for that because you're going to the end of the world. And it's totally different. And, of course, you're going to go with one of these expeditions because you can't just hop on a plane (laughs) and and go to Antarctica. But I want to make sure that the trip that I pick, I get the experience that I'm looking for. I just don't want to totally walk on glaciers and see penguins. I want to know more about all of this, what's going on down there and what's been going on down there and a lot more about the geography and the oceanography and everything. Because I do think it's probably a very powerful place in terms of energy and that kind of thing. But the climate is so harsh 
Now you know what I'm in the mood for. Now to the final selection. But the way I think, (laughs) I have to digress a little (laughs) bit more, okay? It was so hard for me to stick to three. So I'll just tell you, I could narrow it down to four. Wow. (laughs) So you get three with one landing. A bonus, yeah. But I have to share with you some of the great options that didn't make the cut. (laughs) I can't help it. You really showed me, didn't you? You. (laughs) Yeah, then I cannot help it. I cannot help. I mean, I thought this, I thought preparing for this, I'd be, yeah, okay, I'm going to here, I'm going to there. This is it. Once I got into thinking, oh, God, I thought, oh, this is, uh, maybe I was. And then, like anybody who loves to travel, they want to really kind of think about it. And just get into it. And I mean, it it wore me out. <laughs> just trying to, like I said, tame this tiger. So, all right. The first one that didn't make it was the wellness retreat. And it probably should make it, but it didn't make it. Some of the great options that I found, there was one called the Art of Living Retreat. And it's in the Blue Ridge Mountains right outside of Boone, North Carolina. And they have really some very, I think, good programs. And it's a really nice facility. It's not a full-fledged hotel, but it's got that North Carolina architecture feel to it. And it's quite, I wouldn't call it luxurious, but I'd call it upscale and very in tune with the mountains and the hills in there. So I looked at everything. I looked at the videos and I thought, oh, yeah, I would be comfortable there. But they had programs that focused on clearing and calming your mind. Programs on happiness and connection. How to have inner peace and joy daily. Now, that's a challenge for a lot of people, to have inner peace and joy daily. When they have to do the same thing and be around the same people, maybe half of the people really they don't like and all that. How do you tap in? to inner peace, enjoy daily. And that's very important because if you let it get out of control, your health is going down, period, and definitely your quality of life. So they have full-blown retreats, like a happiness retreat for, I think it's like four or five days, where they delve deep into what it is to be happy, where you are in your happiness quotient, how you get happier, Everything that could make you happy, as well as their spa effort. Their whole spa approach is Ayurvedic. Is that how you say that? Yeah, Ayurveda, yeah. The Indian philosophy with all the oils and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of an Indian base spiritual undertone, not totally. And then they have a meditation retreat Mm -hmm. where you go for, I think, three or four days. And they give you lessons on how to improve your meditation or show you how to meditate. And you do a lot of meditating. And I don't know what else, but it's supposed to be really good for your mind and your body. I think it's very interesting that you've been, India has been on your list for so many years, and then you're drawn to this type of wellness. Yeah. Yeah. It's not lost on me, the connection. Well, I can tell you. It is haunting me. (laughs) I haven't been there yet. Okay. And then also they do a silent retreat where you have to be silent the whole time. You can't have any tech, nothing. I mean, it is like cold turkey, silent. But there are other things that they get you to do while you're on this silent retreat. All these things are all geared to have you live with really purpose joy, and confidence, to really continuously challenge what your real purpose is in your life or at that point in your life. What really brings you joy? And if you don't have enough joy, how can you start getting or doing things that really make you more joyful, as well as all of that filtering in to make you more confident? I liked all of that. To some people, it might think, oh, well, that sounds kind of hokey. It doesn't really work. might work for two weeks, and then you'll go back to 
sitting in front of the TV, eating too much and stuff like that. But that doesn't matter. Even if you go for a little while and you do slip back, you might have to go back over and over. And then maybe something will catch. But I think it's all good. It's not a negative thing. Then they have real spa retreats. It's all into that Ayurvedic treatments. And, oh, they do everything with that on top of all these healthy meals. And they teach you how to cook better and the whole thing. So it's very comprehensive, much more than I originally thought it was. And what they call it is the art of living retreat center. And I think that's a very good way to describe exactly what they're all about. And they also even have a weekend of creativity where you can go for somebody like me who is not creative at all. I mean, I have the worst handwriting in the world. I can't draw at all. Anything I have to do with 3D sculpture, ugh, I just don't have it. But they suggest people who are not creative or don't think they're creative to do creative things. So one of the things that they have is like a weekend of creativity where you throw pots and you do pottery. Now, that doesn't turn me on to think about it. But maybe if I would do it, I would learn something deep within my mind and soul that I needed to do, like get back to earth or touch the earth or try to make something, use my mind and all that. I mean, I don't know, but I value the fact that it is helping people tap into other parts of their consciousness that they never would. And that might be the secret to what they need to balance out their life. It did make my list. Can you believe it? (laughs) But it's very valuable and I intend to do it. But in general, all their programs I thought were exceedingly affordable. Not inexpensive, but very affordable for the quality. Very good facility and just gorgeous surroundings. Mm -hmm. The mountains where they're located are beautiful. Okay, there was one more wellness type of facility that I really looked at. And this one was not quite as what I call pure in terms of retreat types of experiences. I mean, the art of living seems to be really getting down to, when I say basics, I mean, let's start from the beginning and start building back. Let's throw out the garbage. Let's find the garbage, throw it out, and let's start from the beginning, even if you have to be a child. And not so much like psychiatry or psychology. Some of that's in it, maybe not the psychiatry. But the point is, is let's be realistic about all of this. You can do just so much with this, that, and the other, but you got to get down to whether you really believe something or not. And you just got to sit there until you decide you're sick of doing that and not do it anymore because you don't really believe it and stuff like that. And they give you the right environment and space to do it. In some of these other more posh places, I think it's blocked by either the luxuriousness of it or the physical part of it. It's too much emphasis on the spa aspect or the healing of the body, which I'm totally for now. But I don't think it's quite as down in the essence of what you have to do. But all good now, all good. And I like both. But this one place was called the Amangari. And it is a gorgeous resort focused on wellness. Part of the Amman International Group, which they do a lot of wellness things. And like I said, ultra luxurious. It's in Canyon Point in southern Utah, right in the heart of the American Southwest. Elegant, ultra-modern resort in the plateau and the mountain ridges of the Colorado Plateau. In all of those earthen mountain ranges, not quite the Grand Canyon, but almost, okay? They specialize in restoring, and I probably won't say this right, Hozho, H-O-Z-H-O, which is basically the beauty, harmony, and balance to your health. 
Their wellness focuses on using healing traditions of the Navajo through the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. So I like this very much because you're in this setting of where the Native Americans live and all of that energy in those mountains and everything and their healing uh, traditions and beliefs. They've taken all of this and incorporated it in what they do there. Like I said, this building that they built, I mean, this structure, it's so well designed. How it fits in there, it's modern, it's minimalistic, but it blends in so well with the mountains and the austere feeling of everything. Cool. They have one retreat called the Coco Roo Retreat, which it's to nourish your mind, body, and soul. And they're going to do this particular retreat from January to March in 2019. And they will have a couple of wellness specialists there that are going to focus specifically on the activities of this particular retreat. So you will meet with the specialists. They'll do a complete analysis of where you are, and then they will tailor make your session to what you need but there are all kinds of activities there that you will be involved in to help you basically nurture your mind body and soul this is not so much like that art of living but it's still releasing it's helping you release just frustration pent-up energy And all of that gets your body back into a good flow and a good balance and in tune with nature. So there's a lot of outdoor stuff like hiking, uh, crystal sound baths, mountain biking, cooking classes, kayaking in Lake Powell. They even have Navajo tour guides that will take you into the mountains and they'll do storytelling, ritual dance. I think it's in the Slot Canyons but horseback riding. So here you are enveloped in this southwest part of the United States, which does have a lot of intense energy in there. And you're at this resort using these Navajo traditions and focusing on nurturing your mind, body, and soul. I think this would be very nice because it's very luxurious. But I think it's also very high-minded. So if you can go there and just be and let them get you going in the direction that they think you're ready for and you should go into, I think it would be quite nice. Different. Like, I've always wanted to go to Canyon Ranch and to Miraval, both of those. I mean, one, Andrew Weil was instrumental in developing Miraval in Tucson, and then Canyon Ranch was one of the first that combined the spa and the workshops Mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of things like mother and daughters go there to try to work out, you know, why they can't get along. And like I said, the grieving process and this kind of thing, not quite as real basic about how you get over a problem or get it together like Mm -hmm. the art of living. But Also very good because they focus on eating properly and they have physical reviews and checkups and like your yearly review with your doctor. They can do all kinds of things there. So I've always wanted to go to those two places, but they're still kind of on the luxurious spa. And so I like that. But I thought that this Amangari was... more refined in just all of how that energy and that thought. I I think you have to get on a higher plane Mm. to tune into all of this. So I like that very much. And another thing I learned about their resorts, most all of their resorts really do focus on wellness, and they're all just gorgeous. They even have a trip where you go by Learjet to all of their resorts and do some different type of wellness program that 
it comes out indigenously of what they like in India it's a certain way Thailand it's a certain way it's just ingenious and the fact that they picked this place in Utah in the southwest to do this fabulous resort and build it brand new it's cool it's really cool so it made the list we got caught but I'm going to make it there. Good Lord willing, I definitely will make it there because I think it's very, very special and unique. One other one that piqued my interest was the Ananda. And here again, it's in India, foothills of yeah. India. Boy, something, if I make it to India, I might have some kind of real experience there because it's been a challenge. But that was another one. Okay, so here again, those are how I was thinking along the wellness. I want to do that, but it's not going to happen in 2019 unless something happens with the four I chose doesn't happen. Then I'll default to one of these. The next trip that made it on the hit list but didn't make it to the final four was a Texas Hill Country road trip. Now, I actually have to admit I got the idea from that travel and leisure special September edition on places that wow you and things to do. And, oh, I've done a lot of travel through Texas. I like Texas. Uh, It's got its own vibe. It really could be its own country. But I have never really been in the hill country. I've been to San Antonio as well as Austin. But the way that they describe taking this particular route and this road trip through the hill country, I thought this would be wonderful because I know that they've got a a German and kind of a Slavic presence in that area because there were quite a few uh, waves of immigrants that moved into that area. And I, being German and Slavic and Prussian by basically former parents and grandparents, and my mother's always thought, oh, I love the bread there, blah, 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 and everything. And Well, she lived in Beaumont, Texas for a good part of her life, and she really likes that area of Texas. So when I read about this road trip, I said, that's the road trip I need to take. It won't be too long, but it will be just right. And it's got a lot of those little towns that once really had their heyday, but they're still kicking. They're the kind that are featured in magazine articles. You don't want to stay there more than two nights. (laughs) But that time you spend there was wonderful, and that was enough time you need to move on. But some of them are like Fredericksburg, Wimberley, Washington, Johnson City, Comfort, Medina, and Leakey, which is supposed to be the Swiss Alps of Texas. I'd like to see what that looks like. (laughs) And then San Antonio and Austin. But food is great, typical, lots of different Tex-Mex, barbecue. German food, ethnic American food, (laughs) if there's such a thing. But that's what you get around that area with that German food, too. Some great, actually, boutique hotels or some interesting hotels. They've got the Inn at Dos Brises, which is Relais Chateau. I forgot exactly where that one was. I think that one was in Washington, I think. I'm not sure. Also, the La Cantera Resort and Spa in San Antonio, if you just want to stay in a real nice place. Then Lake Austin, an even nicer spa and resort. That spa almost made it on my wellness because they have those programs for personal growth. And it's really nice. And they focus a lot on cooking and cooking classes and growing your own vegetables and stuff so you can use those and you have your own chickens and everything. But I'm not a cook. (laughs) So I thought, "Hmm, I'm going to listen, but I'm not going to do it unless something miraculously happens and I change everything about my personality. (laughs) Then also they recommended staying at the Collective Retreats, which is near Wembley. And guess what they are, Catherine? Luxury tents. Oh. Glamping. Glamping. (laughs) Yes. Oh, glamping in the hill country. Now, that might be beautiful. That might be really fun. Yeah. So 
I thought this was very interesting. So it almost made it to the top hmm. four. And I'm going to do this one one time because I think here again, like I said, it gives you enough time behind the wheel, then enough stops, enough different things to kind of go back in time and everything. I think it'd be quite nice to do. So I just wanted to give also the listeners an idea of what I talk about on road trips. You don't have to go from Miami to Maine. You can just do a little thing, but kind of figure out what the theme will be or how you want to experience it. Okay, the next one was a week-long castle stay in Ireland. Now, it's the last dream travel trip for 2009 that didn't make the cut, but I tell you, it almost made the cut. Because I've only been to Ireland one time, but I felt really absolutely madly in love with the Green Isle. And I was so shocked because I'm really not one of these nature girls or these people that love to be out and close to nature and everything. I like it, but I'm not a, a nature girl. Give me Paris. Give me London. Give me Dubai. Give me Shanghai, Miami Beach. I mean, I like those kind of places. But I'm not opposed to be in the woods and hike. I like that too. But when I really think about where I want to go and then I have to pick and choose, that usually falls off the radar. But I had to go to Ireland for a travel bloggers conference, and I was just astounded. First and foremost, the natural beauty of the country was so comforting to me. I just felt so in tune with that place, and it just shocked me totally. Then how friendly the people are. The people there are got to be the friendliest, maybe, in the whole wide world. They are all friendly. I mean, I didn't meet one person who was Irish that had a bad attitude. Now, I know they're there because I've seen a lot of movies where they'll fight you in a minute. Those guys, if you say one thing wrong and they've had three too many beers, oh, boy, the whole pub will go down. <laughs> but I thought they were ultra-friendly. Then I really thought there was kind of a mystical feeling, like going through the countryside and the seashores. It was just breathtaking. I've just talked so much on this. I hope I don't lose some of my listeners. Because I told my sister this, and she didn't look at me with one of her eyebrows up like, oh, you've been doing too much traveling. (laughs) But when I went there, the mystical feeling, I thought, you know, well, this is the land of the leprechauns and all these fairies, but I swear, I was thinking, because certain little things would go wrong, and that's what kind of made me think of this. Nothing big, but like for some reason, I couldn't turn the light on, and I kept doing it, and then I'd find my way to the bathroom, and when I'd come back and try to turn the light on again, and the light would go on. It's like somebody was kind of just playing with me, (laughs) just Funny little things like that. And I know that's a way off, but I did get those thoughts, and I don't believe that. But I'm just saying you can see there's something in the air that made those fables and those mysterious things. And please, anybody from Ireland who's listening who do believe them and they feel strongly about it, they're more in tune to it than me. But something was trying to tune in with me (laughs) when I was there. And I really liked it. That's what I'm trying to say. Just beautiful. And the quaint villages and the towns, it just makes you know that there's still lots of areas in the world that people live simply, and they are quite content. They really are content because they could do things differently. They have the Internet, and they have the ability They might not have a whole lot of money, but they could, but they don't want to because it's wonderful. (laughs) It really, to them, it's wonderful. And it is wonderful. You can feel how wonderful they feel. (laughs) Lots of happy, lively music. I mean, it's everywhere, out in the streets, in the pubs. And that doesn't come from a, a population of people that are all hung up, stressed out. You can't get down like that every night. They love it. They just love it. And I loved going to those places and watching the grandmothers and the grandkids dance, the couples dance, people dancing by themselves. I mean, people were just having a good time. And it was amazing how 
they could take a regular song and start it just a regular My Country Tis a Fiddle. And by the time they got through, they could have it rocking and rolling. That I mean, the lights would be banging from side to side. Everybody would be jumping and dancing. I mean, they could put that fire and their rhythms and their little sounds and harmonies in it to where you can't help but tap around and just it, it's so much fun so that's what i'm trying to say that spirit is all through ireland so i was thinking that i really want to go back to ireland and i want to experience ireland in a way that suits my taste i didn't want to go like bed and breakfast in ireland i was thinking oh well instead of going to a iconic resort why don't I go to a castle hotel? Because when I went to Ireland, I learned that there's so many castles in fine manners that they've now turned into hotels, and they are beautiful. Well, there were a couple that hit the list, and this one really almost made the list, is Ashford. I want to go there one day. I actually would love to spend a Christmas there, but it's in County Mayo, And it is really the most magnificent castle hotel, definitely in Ireland. I think it won the best hotel in the world in like 2016 or something. It's uh, owned by the Carnation Group, and it's just over the top. Now, it's pricey. You have to know it's pricey. But it's furnished with antiques, and I mean, it's just gorgeous. And then the spa is really luxurious and new but done in a very tasteful way. And one thing I liked so much when I went to Ireland and I visited some of the castles that you could tour in the manors, they have something about the way they do the interiors. They use chintz and tapestry, and they have fine paintings and fine fabrics like the other European countries. And they're a little like the English But their whole way that they put a room together is so warm. It's like a a warm, aristocratic kind of feel. You feel comfortable going into those places. You could sit down, and you wouldn't think, oh, I better not sit on this, or this is so perfect, I don't know. Every one of those places were so warm, I thought, boy, this is what I love. I love when things are really fine and you feel like you sit all over it. It'd be very comfortable. That's the way all their interiors were. That's so you, that it really is. I love that. That's my cup cup of tea. And and with a lot of, you know, kind of eclectic, it's not quite as balanced and it's different from the English. It has a feel of the British Isles, but it's different. It's much more comfortable. But to me, just as refined if you do it well. Another one of these castle hotels, and I'm mentioning this because for our listeners, if this is striking a nerve, then you can write these places down because I've looked at them all and I boiled it down to the best. This is some of why it took me so long to do this, Catherine. I mean, I was going, now do I want to go there? No. Okay. The next one is called Bally Nahinch. Now, I know I'm not totally saying that in the Irish way, but that's what it is. B-A-L-L-Y-N-A-H-I-N-C-H. Now, that's a weird word, and I'm sure it comes from some kind of Gaelic whatever, but it's quite beautiful. The next one is the Adair Manor in Shannon. This one was just refurbished. Oh, it's beautiful. And the last one is Powers Court. Now, Powers Court, was an old castle. Well, it was bought by the Ritz-Carlton Group, and it had magnificent gardens. The gardens were actually more beautiful than the hotel or the castle itself that they turned into a hotel. But another group has bought it from the Ritz-Carlton, so it's not quite the Ritz-Carlton. But it is in a beautiful area in the world, and it made the top list. But what's so wonderful about these hotels is you not only go and stay there, but they have all kinds of activities like horseback riding, fly fishing, canoeing, hiking, biking, spas. You get all that nature experience that you want 
as well as all the spa experience, as well as staying in a castle <laughs> and having drinks in this room one night and another room the next night and eating breakfast in the solarium one. I mean, you know, you can just feel like you are lady so-and-so. I mean, <laughs> that's the kind of experience that you have in a place like that. So I love Ireland. And I told you about those iconic hotels. And so I kind of combined the iconic hotel in Ireland with the castle stays, these castle hotels. I'm going to definitely do this. That is another one of my cup of teas. That is what travel's all about. Sometimes you escape to places and do things that take you into a whole different kind of consciousness, even if it's passé. It still can be great and be very enjoyable and be definitely worth spending the money in doing that particular experience. So I hope my listeners, some of them say, oh, yeah, that sounds like great. And they just get on a plane, take Aer Lingus. Aer Lingus now is just really up their game. They really are a great airline. Beautiful airport in Dublin. Everything's easy. So that's highly recommended. We're going to wrap it there today for Solo Travel Talk with the sort of the dreaming phase of Astrid's planning for next year. Next week, we're going to get into her four choices for where she's actually going to go. If you want to make your packing just a little bit easier, Astrid has an amazing packing list that you can get complimentary. You just go to her website, astridtravel.com. Right there on the homepage is a place that you can put in your email and get that packing list right away. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify. We love our Spotify listeners. Thank you. You really can find this podcast any of the finer places that podcasts can be found. We love people who subscribe to the show. Why? Because not only does it bring you this show seamlessly every single week, but it also helps push out this solo travel talk information to potential travelers. You can always ask Astrid a question at her website, astridtravel.com. There's an Ask Astrid section. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. We'll be back with part two next week of Astrid's Dream List. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Solo Travel Talk. Follow Astrid on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. To learn more about Astrid or Solo Travel Advisors, visit her website, astridtravel.com.